you have your Bible with you this morning, go back to Acts chapter 8, please. Acts the 8th chapter. We got a lot to talk about this morning in a relatively short amount of time. So we got to go ahead and jump right into it and get to the business at hand. And Acts the 8th chapter. And Acts the 8th chapter, beginning with verse number 14. After telling us about the occasion when Philip the Evangelist went down from Jerusalem to Samaria and he began preaching the word of God to the people and he baptized many of them, including a sorcerer that was among them named Simon. The Bible says in verse 14, Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them, they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right with God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. What was the big deal? What was the big problem? I mean, why did the apostle Peter so strongly rebuke this new convert, Simon, on this occasion? I, I mean, he didn't commit the physical act of, a, of adultery. He didn't cheat on his wife. He didn't murder anybody. He didn't lie to anybody or bow down and, and worship some pagan god. This new convert, Simon, he didn't do any of that stuff. He didn't commit any of those kinds of sins. And so why is Peter, why is Peter so mad? Why is he so mad? Why is he so upset on this occasion? Someone says, well, well Sean, the reason why Peter is so upset it's because Simon is disrespecting the Holy Spirit. He's disrespecting God. He's actually trying to purchase the power of God with money. Someone says that's the reason why Peter is so upset on this occasion. And while I do agree that all of those things are true, let me suggest that there is more going on here in this text. That we got to look a little closer at to see. Let me suggest in addition to disrespecting God and trying to purchase his power with money, another reason why Peter is sternly rebuking Simon on this occasion is because he knows he has a heart problem. He has a heart disease. He has a spiritual heart disease. Notice again the text. In verse number 21, in verse 21, Peter says to Simon, your heart is not right with God. You see that? In verse number 22, he says, pray to the Lord that if possible, he might forgive the intention of your heart. In verse number 23, he says, I see that you, or in this case, your heart is in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. I want to highlight that word gall that Peter uses there in the text. That word gall that Peter uses there is not a word that we really use a whole lot in our society today, but it has a very powerful meaning. This word gall that Peter uses actually is a reference to poison. It is actually a reference to poisonous secretion that came from various plants. In other words, here in this text, the apostle Peter is saying to Simon, he is saying, Simon, the reason I got a problem with you right now, the reason why God has a problem with you is because you've been poisoned. 
you've been poisoned in your heart. You've been poisoned by bitterness in your heart. The reason why you tried to purchase the power of God with money is because you have been poisoned. You've been poisoned by bitterness. You've been poisoned by bitterness. Here Peter is exposing the bitterness that was in Simon's heart on this occasion. And let me just ask you this morning, have you ever experienced that before? In your own life, have you ever been poisoned by bitterness? Have you ever been poisoned in your heart by bitterness? Do you even know what it means to be poisoned in your heart by bitterness? I ask you that question because bitterness is not a sin that we talk a whole lot about today. It is not a sin that we really emphasize a whole lot like we do the sin of adultery or the sin of fornication or homosexuality or even murder. You see, unlike sins like that, bitterness is often viewed by us, the people of God today, as something that's not really a big deal. We view it as something that's not really serious business in the eyes of God. But I want you to notice how, according to the Apostle Peter, bitterness is serious business in the eyes of God. Bitterness is a big deal in the eyes of God. Bitterness is something that the devil can use to cripple us and disable us and wreak all kinds of, of, of spiritual havoc in our lives. That's what the Apostle Peter is saying there in that text. And so since that is the case, I think as we continue on with our Rise and Above series for the year, we need to spend some, some time talking about that. I think as we continue this series today, we need to spend some time talking about bitterness and the poison that it puts in our hearts and, and how God says we need to rise above it in our lives. Will you spend a few moments with me this morning talking about, talking about bitterness? Let's begin by first pointing this out. Let's begin by first pointing out that when it comes to bitterness, bitterness is something that is easy to hide. It is easy to disguise. It is easy to conceal, even in an assembly like this, from other people because it is a sin that occurs in the inside. It is a sin that occurs inside a person's heart. I mean, that's exactly what Peter says to Simon back in Acts chapter 8. Remember in Acts chapter 8 and verse number 21, before telling Simon that he was in the gall of bitterness, Peter first told him, he said, your heart's not right. He, he says your heart is, is not right with God. You see, from that language, we learn that bitterness is a heart problem. Bitterness is a heart disease. It is a spiritual heart disease. It is something that can be easy to, to hide and, and disguise and conceal, but eventually, eventually it does manifest itself. Eventually it does come out of a person. It will either come out in a person through their speech or through their body language, or in how they are treating other people. Another way we could say that is when it comes to bitterness, we need to understand that bitterness is often connected to many other sins. It is often tied to many other sins. It is often tied to many of the deeds of the flesh that the Apostle Paul talks about in Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21. It is often tied to outbursts of anger and disputes and dissensions and factions. It is often tied to malice and gossip and just flat out rudeness and meanness. It is often tied to selfishness and slander and unforgiveness and, and jealousy and, and envy. In fact, when it comes to jealousy and envy, that is exactly what was going on with Simon back in Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8 and verse number 23, again, Peter says, For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness 
and in the bondage of iniquity. I submit to you that the bitterness that Peter speaks of in that verse is a bitterness that is tied to jealousy. It is a bitterness that is tied to envy. It is a bitterness that is tied to jealous envy. We should have noticed that when we considered Simon's background in our scripture reading this morning. Going back to the scripture reading this morning, the brother Jake read for us. Remember, in the scripture reading, we are introduced to Simon. We are told right away that when it came to Simon, Simon was a sorcerer, right? He was a sorcerer. He was a sorcerer who through magic and all kinds of other forms of trickery, he had been deceiving the people of Samaria for a very long time. He had been deceiving them maybe for many years into thinking that he had great power from God. But now that he's a Christian, now that he's a follower of Jesus, now that he's been baptized for the remission of his sins and he sees the Apostle Peter and the Apostle John really do have great power from God. Guess what? He wants it. He, he wants it bad. He is coveting this power they have from God. He's thinking to himself, why can they have that, that kind of power? But but I can't. Well, why can they perform real and legitimate miracles, but I can't? Why can they impart the ability to perform miracles to other Christians, but I can't? I know what I will do. I will try to purchase that power with money. That's the kind of stuff that Simon is thinking on that occasion. You see, the fact that Simon did not have the same kind of power as the apostles, that put some bitterness in his heart. That put some jealousy and some envy in his heart. That actually put him in the bondage of iniquity. It made him a slave of sin, Peter says. And so that means that when it comes to bitterness, bitterness is something that will keep us out of heaven. You want to go to heaven, don't you? I believe you want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. And if we really want to go to heaven, we need to understand that the poison of bitterness it will keep us out of heaven. It will make it so that we don't get any part of being in heaven with God. When well, you go in your Bible to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, please. Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Look at verse number 15. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, and in verse number 15, the Hebrew writer says this. He says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, Th that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. Now notice how in this verse, the Hebrew writer in the second part of the verse makes our first point. He makes the point of how bitterness is a root of all kind of problems. It is tied to so many other things that are contrary to the will of God. He makes that point in the second part of the verse, but notice the first part. In the first part of the verse, he tells us that bitterness is so serious that it will cause us to come short of the grace of God. We've been talking about the grace of God today. The grace of God is what saves us. We understand that, right? We understand that we are saved by the grace of God. We understand that we are saved by grace through faith. The Bible makes that very clear. If we're going to make it to heaven at all, then it's going to be by the grace of God. But notice how bitterness can cause us to come short of that grace. It can cause us to come short of the grace of God that we need to save us and so we can go to heaven. Paul makes a similar point in Galatians 5 and verse 21. In Galatians 5 and verse 21, Paul talks about jealousy and, and envy. He says those are deeds of the flesh and, and people who practice those things, they want to inherit the kingdom of God. Listen carefully to me, please. If you don't remember anything else from this sermon this morning, if you want to fall asleep after this, feel free to be my guest. But if you don't remember anything else from this sermon, will you at least remember that we can't harbor bitterness and any of the things that are tied to it and expect to go to heaven? We can't be envious of people and their good fortune in life and expect to go to heaven. 
We can't be jealous of other people and their good fortune in life and expect to go to heaven. We can't harbor grudges. We can't be rude and mean and unkind. We can't have unforgiveness in our hearts and expect to go to heaven. That's just not going to work. That, that is just not what the Bible teaches. That is not what the scriptures say. That is not please God on any level at all. In fact, those kinds of heart issues actually stand in direct opposition to the things of God. They actually stand in direct opposition to everything the Bible tells us about God and his character and his nature. Let me tell you something. If you search your Bible from top to bottom, from Genesis to Revelation and anything else in between, and what you're going to see is when it comes to God, when it comes to the God we serve, when it comes to the one true and living God, the creator of the universe, that God is not a God who is envious. That God is not a God who harbors grudges. He is not a God who is unkind and, and, and selfish. He is not a God who is unwilling to forgive people who do him wrong. In fact, to the contrary, the Bible says that when we repent and ask God to forgive us, not only will he forgive us, but he will what? Remember our sins no more. You see, when God forgives, unlike us, he really forgives. He really forgives his people. Bitterness stands in direct opposition to everything God tells us about his character and about his nature. Bitterness will destroy our relationship with God, but not only will it destroy our relationship with God, we also need to understand that it will destroy our relationship with other people. It would also destroy the relationships we have with members of our family. It will destroy the relationship we have with our spouse and with our kids and with our siblings and with our parents and with our in-laws. It will destroy the relationships that exist between elders or shepherds and gospel preachers and other brothers and sisters in Christ. It can make it so that we never forgive brothers and sisters in Christ. It will make it so that we hold grudges for decades against brothers and sisters in Christ that we feel have done us wrong. It will lead us to having a spirit that says, I will never forgive that person. I will never have anything to do with that person. I'm going to stay completely away from that person and I'm going to be bitter towards that person. I'm going to have negative thoughts about that person because guess what? They hurt me. They slighted me in some way. They overlooked me in some way. They did something to me that, that I just don't like. Bitterness will destroy the relationships that God wants to exist between his people. And let me ask you this. When it comes to our spouse, when it comes to our marriages, have you ever, you ever been bitter against your spouse? You ever been bitter against your husband or against your wife? Now, if you're thinking right now that you've never been bitter towards your husband or your wife, I want you to come up to me after service and tell me that because guess what? That means we need to have a sermon about lying. <laughs> I need to know that because we need to have a sermon about lying. I don't care who you are this morning. I don't care how spiritually mature you may think you are. I don't care how, may, how embarrassing it may be to admit this. I don't care how long you've even been married. Bitterness at some point has found its way into your marriage. You know it and I know it. You know that there are times when spouses have conflicts because one feels that the other is not really being fair in their relationship. You know that the spouses sometimes think, well, why is it OK for them to, to spend a bunch of money on the things that they like? But when I want to spend a little money, when I want to splurge a little bit, it's, it's like World War Three in this house. Well, why do I never get a say in how the house is decorated? Why do people like and respect my spouse so much, but they don't like and, and respect me. You know those kinds of spirits are sometimes manifested in a marriage. You know that. 
And for all the young people in the room this morning, let me ask you this. You, you ever been bitter towards your parents? You ever been resentful towards your parents? You ever been resentful because you didn't like a, a certain curfew that they gave you? Or, or you didn't like that they took your cell phone away for, from you for a time? Or you didn't like that they didn't let you date a certain boy or a certain girl? Or maybe you felt bitter because you felt abandoned by your parents. Maybe you felt abandoned by your biological parents. I want you to know that I've certainly struggled with that. I certainly have been guilty of being bitter about that as someone who's never seen my biological father before in my life. I know what that's about. Bitterness can destroy relationships. And bitterness is, is very deceptive. Let me ask you something. How often in your life have you ever seen someone repent of bitterness? How many times have you seen someone come forward or maybe just call you on the phone and say, you know what, I, I need to confess a sin. I need to confess that I'm guilty of bitterness. I don't know about you, but I've never seen that before. Now, I've seen Christians repent of many different sins. I've seen them repent of lying and stealing and having misplaced priorities. I've seen Christians repent of doing drugs and drinking and even committing adultery. And I've seen them repent of all those kinds of sins, but, but I've never seen anyone in my life ever acknowledge and repent of bitterness. In fact, the man who trained me to preach, a man who's been preaching for 40 years, he once told me, he once said that in 40 years of preaching the gospel full time, he had only seen two cases, two of Christians who repented of bitterness. He'd only seen that two times, and in one particular case, a woman came to him and, and she acknowledged how bitterness had made her life miserable. She acknowledged how bitterness had made her a slave. It had made her a slave of sin. It had made her a slave of the person that she was bitter against, and she was tired of living that way. She was tired of being that kind of slave every single day, and so she gave it up. She repented of that bitterness, and I'm going to tell you something. That's rare. It is rare for Christians to even privately repent of bitterness. Instead of repenting of bitterness, you know what we like to do? We like to hold on to our bitterness. We like to justify our bitterness. We like to lie about our bitterness. We like to be pitiful and think things like, well, you know what? I deserve to feel this way. I deserve to be angry. I deserve to be resentful. I deserve to wallow in this unforgiving spirit because that person was just wrong. That person hurt me. That person hurt me deeply. That person betrayed my trust. That person embarrassed me in front of other people. You see, while all sin is certainly deceptive, bitterness is a sin that it is especially deceptive. It is easy to lie to ourselves and justify, try to justify why it's okay to be bitter. And in fact, it's so deceptive that you know another consequence of bitterness? It can linger a long time. It can linger a long time in a person's life. I think that's exactly what happened in the case of King Saul. Will you go in your Bible, please, to 1 Samuel, the 18th chapter? You remember King Saul, don't you? Remember Saul was the first king of Israel. He was a man who started out with a lot of promise and a lot of potential, but eventually, when it was all said and done, he was a failure. He was a complete failure in the eyes of God. Now, one of the reasons why this man was such a failure, one of the reasons why he was not a man of God was because he was a bitter man. He let bitterness destroy his heart. He was bitter towards God for rejecting him as king, but he was also bitter towards David, remember? He was very bitter towards David, king, the, the future King David. 
And so we see in 1 Samuel 18 and verse 7, the context here is, is David is rising up in the ranks. He's becoming a great military leader. He's accomplishing a lot of victories for Israel. David should be, or Saul rather, should be ecstatic to have a man like this working for him. But he's not. And so in 1 Samuel 18 and verse 7, it says, The women sang as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten, his ten thousands. Verse 8, Then Saul became very angry. For this saying displeased him, and he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, but to me they have, they have ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? Now look at verse 9. Saul looked at David with what? Suspicion. From that day on. Do you see the bitterness that's in this man's heart? Do you see the jealousy that's in his heart? Do you see the envy that's in his heart? Saul is jealous and envy because David is so respected by the people of Israel. He is bitter towards David. In fact, not only is he bitter towards David, but as you continue his story, as I said, you're going to see that he's going to become bitter towards God. He's going to be bitter about the fact that God rejects him as king and he's going to give the kingdom to David. He doesn't like that at all. In fact, for much of his reign, you know what Saul does? He actually tries to fight against that. He actually tries to kill David on several occasions because he just can't accept the will of God. He's a bitter man. Bitterness destroyed Saul and made him an infamous man. But another person I think about is Esau. You remember Esau, the brother of Jacob? We read from Hebrews 12 a few minutes ago, Hebrews 12, verse 15. Well, if you go home and read the verses that, that come after that, the Hebrew writer emphasizes his point about bitterness there by mentioning Esau. He tells us that Esau was a very bitter man. And I want you to go in your Bible to Genesis chapter 27, please. In Genesis chapter 27, we see why Esau was so bitter towards Jacob. Remember, Esau had both his birthright and his blessing stolen by Jacob. Jacob stole those two things from him. Those things were supposed to be his as the firstborn. But, but Esau had that taken from him. And after he had his blessing stolen from him, by Jacob. He, Jacob deceived Isaac and stole it. When Esau found out about it, in Genesis 27, verse 41, verse 41, it says, So Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near. My father's about to die. Then I will what? Then I'm going to kill I'm going to kill my brother Jacob. Notice how after having his blessing stolen, Esau was bitter about that. Esau held a grudge. He had a grudge. He held a grudge towards his brother Jacob concerning that. He actually promises there to kill Jacob once their father dies. And thankfully, when you continue reading their story, Esau doesn't do that. Thankfully, Esau overcomes this. He softens his heart. He overcomes his bitterness. He buries the hatchet. They reconcile. He forgives his brother. They move on. They get past it. But unfortunately, there's still going to be consequences for his bitterness. Unfortunately, the bitterness between the brothers is going to end, but their descendants are going to are going to have some consequences. Their descendants, the Edomites and the Israelites, are going to be bitter towards each other for many years, and that probably can be contributed to what happened with Esau. Esau's bitterness has some long-lasting effects. What I just want you to see is Peter was right. He was right. He was right in what he was saying to Simon. Bitterness is a big deal. Bitterness is serious business. Bitterness is something that can damage our relationships with each other and with God. And it will cause us to lose our soul. The question, though, is this. The question is, how do we overcome it? If I got bitterness in my heart this morning towards someone, how do I overcome this? How do I rise above this? How do I get this poison out of my life right now? 
Well, let me give you just four things real quick, real quick that we got to do if we're going to overcome bitterness. And the first thing is this. The first thing you got to do, my friends, if you want to overcome bitterness, if you want to rise above it, is you got to get some humility. You got to get some humility. You got to become a humble person. You got to be humble in yourself. You got to stop lying to yourself. You got to be willing to honestly acknowledge your problem. And James chapter three, let's get some James in here this morning. Let's go to James, the third chapter, and let's look at verse number 14. And James, the third chapter in verse number 14, James says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant. Do not be arrogant. And so lie against the truth. Notice how James says that if you're going to overcome bitterness, if I'm going to overcome it, if we're going to overcome it together, then we can't be selfish. We can't be arrogant. We can't arrogantly lie to ourselves about our condition. Instead, we, we got to be humble. We got to humbly tell the truth. We got to tell the truth to ourselves. We got to look into the spiritual mirror and say, hey, you know what? I got a problem. I got a problem. I got a sin problem. I got a heart problem. I got bitterness in my heart, and it's causing me to be jealous and envious and unkind and just a bunch of other things that God doesn't want me to be. The first step to rising above bitterness is being humble. Humbly telling the truth to yourself and acknowledging you got a problem. Now, after you do that, after you get some humility, the second thing we got to do if we're going to overcome this is we then got to get some grace. We got to get some grace and some mercy. Like Brother Brian talked about this morning, we got to replace all the bitterness that may be in our hearts right now with grace and mercy. And so are you still in James chapter 3? Look at verse 13. Let's read the whole context. Verse 13, who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds, and the gentleness of wisdom. You can't be bitter and gentle at the same time. It's not going to work. Verse 14, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but it's earthly. It's natural. It's demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there is disorder. And every evil thing but the wisdom from above is first pure, is peaceable, is gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, good fruit, fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. You can't be bitter and do the things he's talking about in verse 17. The things in verse 17 are the complete opposite of bitterness. Now you put that with what Paul says. I really like what Paul says in Ephesians 4. I like how Paul acknowledges the problem of bitterness in that text, but he also gives solutions. He acknowledges the problem and, give, and then gives us some solutions. And so in Ephesians 4 and verse 31, he says, Let all bitterness, let it all, all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. I want to highlight that language in verse 31. That language, be put away. Do you see that? Let bitterness be put away. That language that Paul uses there, and listen carefully, that language Paul uses there is the same language that Jesus uses in Matthew 19 and verse 9. When he says, and I say to you, whoever puts away, some of your translations say, whoever divorces his spouse, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. Paul is using the exact same language that Jesus uses there. He is saying that while God doesn't want us to divorce our spouse, he does want us to get a divorce from bitterness. It's okay to get a divorce from bitterness. It's okay to put off bitterness. God wants us to put away bitterness. He wants us to sever the marriage we may have to bitterness. And he wants us to join ourselves to the things Paul talks about in verse 32 of that chapter. He wants us to join ourselves to all the things Brian talked about this morning. The kindness, 
the compassion, the tenderheartedness, the forgiveness. God wants us to get married to that kind of stuff. He wants us to be like him. He wants us to be like Jesus instead of staying married to bitterness. We need to get a divorce from it and we need to put God's will first. We need to put God's will first. Let me tell you something. When we let bitterness just boil over in our hearts every day, the will of God is not going to get accomplished. It's not going to get accomplished in our lives. It's not going to get promoted in our lives. It's not going to get promoted in our marriages. I'm going to Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. Look at Colossians 3. Colossians 3, and Paul says something interesting here. In Colossians 3, verse 18, he says, Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be what? Do not be embittered against them. There it is. Now, let me ask you something. Why in the world is that there? We may not like this there, so why is it there? Why did the Holy Spirit inspire Paul to write that verse? Well, the reason why the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write that verse is because God knows us better than we know ourselves. God's the one who created marriage, and God knows everything about marriage. He knows that bitterness occurs in marriages. He knows that sometimes husbands are bitter against their wives, and sometimes wives are bitter against their husbands, and if that kind of stuff is not nipped in the bud and taken care of, guess what? That marriage will suffer. That marriage will have all kinds of problems. There's going to be all kinds of disorder in that relationship. That's why forgiveness, we've been talking about forgiveness today. Forgiveness, my friends, is absolutely essential in a marriage. The love of Jesus Christ is absolutely essential in a marriage. Two people stripping themselves of selfish ambition and resentment of past offenses from past offenses. That is absolutely essential in a marriage. Bitterness must be eliminated for a marriage to thrive. And it also must be eliminated for our relationship as brethren to thrive. Do you remember this problem that Paul and Barnabas had in Acts 15? Do y'all remember that? Remember, it was over John Mark. Because John Mark had deserted them on the first preaching journey, Paul didn't want nothing to do with John Mark no more. He's like, this guy's not going with me this time. He's a quitter. Barnabas, being the son of encouragement, he's like, no, I'm going to give this guy another chance. Let's let him go with us and prove himself the second time. They did not agree on that. They had an argument about that. In fact, the Bible makes it very clear, I think, that they had a sharp and powerful argument about that. They did not see eye to eye on that at all. But you know what? Instead of acting like little babies like we do from time to time, instead of folding up their arms and pouting and saying, I didn't get my way and I'm going to go home and, and I'm just going to, I'm going to let this just stew over in me. Instead of doing that, you know what they did? They figured out a way to still do God's will first. They figured out a way to put God's will first. They said, you know what, since we can't agree on this, we're going to split up. Barnabas, you take John Mark, you go that way. Paul says, I take Silas, and I'm going to go the other way. We don't agree on this, but we're not going to be bitter about it. We're going to put God's will first. That's what they did. The question is, are we doing that? The question is, are we putting God's will first in our lives, or are we allowing the devil to use bitterness to stop us from putting God's will first? Are we allowing the devil to stop us from doing things like loving other people and forgiving other people and being kind to other people and reconciling with other people and, and wanting what is best for other people? I want to submit that if we're struggling with putting God's will first because bitterness is in the way, you know what we need to do? One more thing. We need to repent. We need to repent right here and right now, and we shouldn't care what anybody else has to say about it. Go back to Acts 8 one more time. 
Let's bring this full circle. Remember after Simon had his bitterness exposed by Peter, in verse 21, he said, you have no part or portion in this matter for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you're in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. Notice how Peter said to Simon, what you need to do since you got bitterness, bitterness in your heart is you need you need to repent. You need to pray to God and you need to beg him to forgive you for this bitterness. That's what Simon needed to do. And guess what? That's what we need to do. That's what I need to do. That's what you need to do. If we have bitterness in our hearts this morning, we need to stop making excuses and we just need to repent. We need to change and we need to reform. We need to pray to God today and we need to beg him to forgive us and we need to beg him to replace the bitterness in our hearts with his love. That's what we need to do. In fact, I submit that if anyone had a right to be bitter, it would be God. Would you agree with that? I mean, when we consider all the stuff we've done against God, when we consider all the sins we've committed against God, he could harbor a grudge. He could be bitter. He could be resentful. He could be hateful and unforgiving. But thankfully, he's not that way, is he? Thankfully, he loves us too much to be bitter against us. In fact, he demonstrated that love at the highest level for us 2,000 years ago when he gave his son to die on the cross for our sins. We don't serve a bitter God. Instead, we serve a kind God and a loving God and a God who wants to reconcile with his people. And if that's what you need this morning, if you need God's forgiveness, if you need to be reconciled unto him, you have an opportunity to do that. Whether it means responding to his gospel for the first time through faith and repentance and baptism or repenting, maybe of some bitterness that may be in your heart this morning, whatever spiritual needs you may have. It'll be our pleasure to help you with that right here and right now. Let's stand. Let's sing together.